I've been really looking forward to sharing this film with you because for me, this photographer is a great example of an artist who's found a way to point the things that he loves at a need that he sees in the world. He chose to combine his passion for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution and his passion for photography by traveling around the coast to all 238 RNLI lifeboat stations to take photographs of those places and the people who work there using wet plate collodion photography on glass plates. And he knew when he started out that this project would take him 10 years of his life to complete. In this interview, I'm catching up with him in year eight of this 10 year project and asking him to look back and tell us about finding the courage to leave his day job to start this very long term project. What the RNLI is and why he chose them as the subject for this mammoth project and what it's like to use this 170 year old process to make images on glass plates and what the response is from the subjects who get to stand in front of his camera and see those images revealed on glass. We spoke for over five hours on the day I captured this interview, and of course, there's no ways I can share the vast majority of what we recorded just for the sake of time, but I really would encourage you, once you've watched this short film, that you would click on the link to his website down below, go across and do a deep dive on the work that he does, because there is way more to it than I can contain in this short film, and perhaps even consider supporting the ongoing work that he does to finish off this project. So I'm gonna shut up now and let you hear from my friend, Jack Lowe. I wasn't trying to come up with the idea of the Lifeboat Station project. I was thinking about what would I like to do that's very, very special. And the harder I looked, the more opaque that seemed to be to me, you know. And when I relaxed my mind a little bit and decided to be a bit braver perhaps and own up to the fact that what I'm doing now really isn't where I intended to be, I thought, well, what do I want to do? What are my interests? And is at that point that I ended up exploring things that had floated my boat as a child. That included photography, lifeboats, and the sea. And when I wrote those three words down, it was a very moving moment. I thought, my gosh, surely I can make something from that. So that was stage one, if you like. It was owning up to the fact that what I'm doing now, which at the time was printmaking, for other photographers and ad agencies and I was a retoucher as well so, so all my work was very heavily computer based. So write those words down are the antithesis of that, you know, the antithesis of computers, of other people's work and also I knew that one of my other ambitions would be the print table here in the studio shouldn't be covered with other people's work as it had been for 10, 11, 12 years by that stage. I want it to be my work. What's happened to my photography? And I think it's one of the bravest things that somebody can do actually, is to sit down, and I often recommend it to people as a, as a, a challenge um, to themselves, not to nobody else. You know, forget about other people in this. It's a challenge to yourself. Write down in no more than one short paragraph what you want from your life. And it can often move people to tears when they realize that they have got something to write down that isn't what they're up to right now. And then the second light bulb moment came to me when I was least expecting it. For years in our kitchen at home, we've had the um, RNLI tea towel, the famous one with the map and all the stations dotted around. It's been there right under my nose that whole time. And I was at the kitchen table drinking a cup of tea, just having a, like a gentle Sunday morning. And it's literally as I took the sip from the cup of tea and looked up at the map. So having just recently written down those three words, I thought, oh my goodness. I wonder if anybody's ever done that. Done what, my wife said. <laughs> Been to every single online lifeboat station and made a unified body of work that documents the RNLI family, the RNLI volunteers around our coast. So tapping into these childhood passions that I've had, that I've had you know, all those years, 
so into photography since I was eight years old, and then a couple of years later, joining Stormforce, which is the junior membership program for the RNLI. You know, from an early age, I knew I wanted to be a, a, a photographer and a lifeboatman. And boring adults would tell me, oh, well, you can't do that. You know, you have to find yourself a real job. Well, what's a real job? You know, oh, you're, well, that won't pay you a pension. A pension? What's a pension? Suddenly, everything just, fa just fitted. And I felt like I was being guided into the right position um, to start the um, sowing the seeds of this idea and seeing if I could actually make it happen. The RNLI is a, an organisation born from an island nation, you know, a, a nation surrounded by water. The name doesn't trip off the tongue of what it used to be called. The National Society for the Preservation of Life from Shipwreck, which later became the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. So it's founded in 1824 by Sir William Hillary. And uh, among his motivating words were, with courage, nothing is impossible. And it's on that premise, really, that he was able to motivate people to volunteer to save lives at sea. Um, and there was a, a strange um, tension on the coast because there were wreckers as well. And wreckers used to make their living from shipwrecks and would intentionally try and lure ships with false lights onto the coast so that the boats could be plundered. That was their living. So there was this real horrible tension for decades um, between people who wanted to save lives at sea and those who wanted to plunder. <laughs> so William Hillary and people like him persevered um, and this institution was gradually formed. And in 1860, um, it became incorporated under Royal Charter and be you know, so became um, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. If you're somebody who lives in the UK and Ireland, you will just expect to see a lifeboat station on the coast. It's something you just go and see is the lifeboat and it's really exciting. You know, I always say, if you don't think that Thunderbirds exists, go and look at an RLI lifeboat station and you'll be proved wrong. <laughs> you know, the lifeboats, the stations, the people, it's all awesome, it's incredible. It's entirely funded by voluntary contributions. Again, an extraordinary thing in itself. You know, people often say, can't believe this isn't government funded. They should be paid £60,000 a year. But um, that conversation has been had. You know, the RNLI had that conversation a long time ago with the government and thought, no, we, we, it's going fine just how it is, thank you very much, and, and isn't then live, you know, subject to cuts and all that kind of thing. It, it works as this hermetically sealed bubble um, that func seems to function largely very well. You know, it's, a, it's an intricate organisation. The logistics are extraordinary. Um, around the coast and that's something that I've had a real insight into um, by now visiting 158 lifeboat stations you know that's how many I've documented now of the 238 stations um, you really get a, an insight into what goes on behind the scenes to make this happen. Fast forward to 2022 and we have an organisation of 238 lifeboat stations with some 5,000 volunteers who are prepared to drop everything at a moment's notice to help somebody in trouble at sea. And that's not nothing, you know? And, and not least because that involves having an arrangement with, with your spouse um, or your employer, that they know that when that pager sounds that you're gonna have to run and uh, make sure you're on that boat when it launches. And that's a very special thing. And I, and I think going back to the notion of that if you're, on, if you're holidaying and you go and see the lifeboat, I think it's taken for granted. And one of the things I'm endeavouring to do with the Lifeboat Station Project is shine a light on the greatness of this organisation. I know that I can't tell the story of a lifeboat station in one photograph. That's just impossible. 
you know, because there are so many things to look at. There's the lifeboat station itself, there's the lifeboat, and there are the, there are the surroundings. So my aim is to, if somebody were to look at the photographs in as a set, that they would get a good idea of where I was that day and what it was like to be there. So the way I always start each day is by photographing the, the view from the lifeboat station. So standing at the boathouse doors if possible and if that's appropriate, or at the top of a launch ramp or something like that, and photographing the view that the lifeboat crews are going out to sea in. The idea behind that is that if the photographs are geographically correctly placed around the gallery space, that the person viewing those pictures will feel like they're looking around the entire coastline of the UK and Ireland. At an all-weather lifeboat station, because there are two types of lifeboat station, there's an all-weather lifeboat station and an inshore lifeboat station. All-weather lifeboat stations are the ones that have the big boats. I photograph the most, um, the, the person who's in charge of the boat, which is the coxswain. And I also photograph the crew as a complete crew portrait. And I, at all-weather lifeboat stations, I also photograph the mechanic. Uh, and if time and logistics allow, I also make a portrait of the women um, to champion the fact that women are doing the same job alongside their male counterparts in a veil, very male-dominated arena. Yes, people are distracted by the process, I think, sometimes. They think it's a, a wet plate project. It's not a wet plate project. You know, the process I'm using is called, its full name seems to be these days wet plate collodion. Um, I think, generally speaking, wet collodion is the accepted name for the process. And it's a very hands-on, handmade process. I'm, I've chosen to do it in perhaps the most complicated, inconvenient way possible. And people do get distracted by the process because it is obviously a very large part of what I do. And so I can understand that distraction. But the process for me is the key to unlocking engagement. The process of making a photograph on glass is the complete opposite of making a digital photograph. It's multi-layered, multi-staged. And so my most important job perhaps is to describe that at first to the people that I'm gonna be working with so that they know what to expect, so they know what I'll be doing and how long it will take. Most people just want to know, when will we finish by? Okay, we'll be done in about 15 minutes from this moment. Okay, that's cool, do whatever you want to do in that time. So then my task after that is to compose the image and I usually have a good idea about how I'm gonna uh, place people and the image I want to make because of the story I want to tell with this particular photograph. And when I'm doing that, doing that I'm under my focusing cloth, uh, looking at the image upside down and back to front. Um, so there are lots of things to contend with. And you know, it's, it's real back to basics, manual gearbox photography. Once the image is composed, I'll remind the person that I'm photographing that I'm gonna dash back to my mobile darkroom and hand make a piece of photographic film on glass. And that usually takes me about eight or nine minutes, something like that. And that's a chemical sequence of pouring chemicals onto glass and then putting that into a bath of silver nitrate, which then sensitizes the plate, you know, makes that piece of photographic film sensitive to light. I then go into safe light mode, you know, I've read safe lights in, in the back of Nina, um, so I can see what I'm doing. And I pull the glass plate out of the silver nitrate, load it into a plate holder, which I need, then need to take back to the camera and plug on the back of the camera and I remind the person that I'm photographing that we're now going to expose the plate so it's the take the dark slide out of the back and the lens cap is my shutter. You know, I always find myself doing these hand gestures because they're, so, they're part of my fabric now, you know? Um, and I count the person down, three, two, one, and I remove the lens cap from, from the lens. And in my head, I count some elephants, one elephant, two elephant, usually about seven or eight elephants, something like that, depending on the conditions, lens cap back on, and I tell the person I'm photographing to relax, or the people, you know, sometimes there could be a whole stage set of th over 30 people. I tell them to relax and hear this kind of collective sigh. I dash back to Nina and I process the plate. Um, and that input that involves going back into darkness, well, into safe light conditions, removing the plate from the holder and pouring developer over it to um, reveal the latent image that's waiting there. 
And when I'm doing that, I'm counting the seconds on the clock that are just by my left ear. There's a reason for everything. You see, in my dark room, everything has a reason. There's a clock just here, and I'm, and I'm counting the seconds because really the optimum development time under normal temperatures is about 15, 16 seconds, something like that. So I'm counting the seconds, but I'm observing the plate. I'm smelling as well because the, uh, there's a very distinctive vinegary smell that rises from the plate when it's correctly processed. Something I've never seen in any of the old manuals. I've never seen that written anywhere. It's just something I've learned. I thought, hang on a minute, there's, there's that magical moment. Pour the water on the plate to stop the development. And then there's the last really magical stage um, where I can open the side door of Nina because uh, the plate's no longer sensitive to light. And the image appears to be this kind of blue, milky negative. But I then pour fixer over the plate and when people watch it and when I watch it because I get a thrill every time it appears to switch from negative to positive before your very eyes you know it feels like alchemy and that's it the photograph is made the reactions are eclectic and very often very moving I've had people give me hugs I've seen people burst into tears um, and then you might ask them about that and they'll say it's the best photograph of themselves they've ever seen or it's the first time they felt happy with how they look or it's just blown away the, all expectations of how they would feel looking at a photograph of, of themselves. And that's one of the things that Wet Collodion is brutal with actually because it sees the world differently. You know, It's very sensitive to blues and ultraviolets which is why all the, the bright red and yellow kit and the, and the bright orange wheelhouses on lifeboats come out dark grey or black even, because they're at the opposite end of the spectrum to um, the sensitivities of wet collodion. And what that actually enables is for you to see the person first. Everything else is quite muted really, but the process is brutal in that regard because you, you not only see the person, it feels like it's somehow got this honesty to it where you really see who they are. So any facade is taken away. I like to introduce people that I'm photographing to the notion that this is conversational. And actually I think Wet Collodion has a knack of almost making you feel like you're in a conversation when you're looking at the, at the photograph. And that would naturally be so because it's seven elephants, eight elephants out of somebody's life. You know, there's been a passage of time there, almost like a film. And there've been heartbeats, there've been thoughts going through their mind and somehow that's tangible. You can see that. And I don't think many people maybe realise that when they're looking at the at a portrait, and but that I'm sure is part of the reason why it's so moving for them. And you know, if, if there's time and it's appropriate, and they want to discuss it further, I'll have this discussion with them. Say if they have been moved to tears, or they give me a hug, or they got their hand on their heart and they're not sure what exactly is going on we'll discuss it further. And I'll say, well, look, you know, you were thinking things there. Your heart's beating through this. We'd had the conversation before. You feel like you, perhaps you, you're nice and relaxed and this is who you are. Quite a common piece of feedback or comment is that I can see my father in myself. I can see my grandfather in myself for the first time. It's as if everything's collided in that moment from their whole lineage to make this very special thing. And although the glass plate is a beautiful object. I think what it actually is, is a memento of that experience, of those emotions for people to carry through for the rest of their days. Mm -hmm.